Okay, my name is Aaron Galloway. Is it being recorded now? Uh, and I give you guys permission to share and record the talk. Okay. okay. Um, are you going to have moderate questions? Or questions on? Sure. <coughs> okay. So those working okay for those that are online. Um, so my talk, as promised, is about combining traditional and novel approaches for observing trophic relationships. And the, by the traditional, I mean just watching and observing. Uh, and by the novel, I don't know if it's so much novel anymore, but the use of uh, fatty acids as biomarkers is really the focus that I'll, I'll be on. So um, first, I want to start by kind of acknowledging my uh, collaborators, many of these people that helped do the work that I'll talk about today. Uh, the Coastal Trophic Ecology Lab is the, my new group um, at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. And we have, I have a couple of grad students, a postdoc, and then a, a bunch of people that has helped with this work. Um, there's a couple of people that I want to acknowledge from ODFW, who might be in the room even, who helped do some of this work. And I've actually had the joy of collaborating with a number of people from OSU. And I won't be talking about all, too much of all that work, but I just wanted to highlight those people now, because I might forget to later. <laughs> hey, there's one of them right now. Hey, Kevin. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, there's some Legos on the table. Feel free to build some creatures. It could, you could actually build a producer, so it doesn't have to be a header set. But um, I, I kind of, I looked, I originally thought about this as uh, build, build some creatures that you might want to make some inferences about what they are consuming when they're in the ocean. So feel free to do that or not. Uh, either way, I, I will come back to this later in the talk, because I've already built mine. So either way, I'll be able to talk about my little creatures. <laughs> I am, a, I guess I'm a, a bigger picture person or something like that. I, I work on a number of different organisms and systems. I'm a marine ecologist, and I'm really interested in figuring out at the, the basic level what major biological forces are structuring uh, marine communities. And I thought it would be good to start out with a little bit of my story, just to kind of break the ice a little bit, and say how I got interested in doing the work that I'm actually doing. I'm gonna kind of watch out there, but as you can see, that's a killer whale in the San Juan Islands. And what originally drove me into interest in marine ecology was interest in predators in particular. Um, I didn't ever study killer whales, but I, as Sarah mentioned, I started out as a commercial fisherman, I grew up in Juneau, and my time fishing was out of Sitka. So, for the seven seasons that I fished, I think I I estimated, you know, as scientists do, we have to come up with numbers for everything, that I probably cleaned about 30,000 salmon stomachs, and that really, at that time, really, really got me interested in trophic ecology on the ocean. When you see that many stomachs over that much time, it's just hard not to be interested um, in what these predators are eating. So for my master's, I ended up working on cougars in central Washington. I'm not going to talk about any of that, but <laughs> I just thought it's funny, you know. It just the path has always been about what thing, what are things eating um, in their environment. We worked on gooey duck aquaculture, and then I got fortunate in, at, later on in my PhD, about midway through after I had started with gooey duck aquaculture, I got a fortunate opportunity to start working on kelp forest ecology and subsidies of kelp forest to deeper subtitle uh, with people at Friday Harbor Labs at UW. And that's where I did my PhD work and some of the work I'll talk about, the, the last parts of that work that I'll talk about today. And I did postdoc work in freshwater systems in Finland and Sweden. And so throughout this journey, it's always been about the, the, the story that's really been consistent throughout is just an interest in what resources are fueling the, the whole marine food web. And that's why I said I'm kind of interested in a lot of the different creatures. So I like to show this image because this is what I start with when I think about trophic ecology. A lot of us do. Um, this is in every, you know, some version of this is in every textbook. And it always has primary producers at the base of the food web doing their job, anchoring the pyramid. And what we always, we usually just, 
it's just like you'll see a couple of cartoons of a couple of different phytoplankton or maybe some algae, uh, but we don't often acknowledge the fact that this transfer, this is the, the, this is the key transfer in the trophic pyramid because algae is not like other, it's not like animals. It has a lot, much, much different uh, nutritional value relative to uh, other consumers, you know, basically the meat of other fish and organisms like that. So this transfer between primary producers and the first primary consumers, if you will, is quite interesting. And that's actually largely just a black box. We kind of accept that it happens, but not much is known there. And one of the reasons is that it's hard to study organisms at the base of the food web. It's hard to know what they're actually eating. So that's kind of a little bit of why I'm interested in that. Um, here's an example of, of what I'm talking about. This is one of the papers that really blew me away um, when I was first starting to think about all this by Brett and Mueller Navarra that showed that for these these two these boxes here, the Clear Lake and Peruvian upline system, these two boxes here, what this is showing is the relative biomass in these systems by the producers. Okay? And what this is by the, the phytoplankton. There's similar concentration of phytoplankton in both these systems. But what this is showing is that for this lake versus the Peruvium upline, there's quite a lot of difference in the secondary and tertiary production that occurs there. And so the reason is that there's difference in the food quality at the base of the food web. In this particular case, the, what, what the, the paper is about is how there's more nutritional phytoplankton in, in the Peruvian upwelling system relative to the others. So that's an so food quality really matters. And that's partly what drives my interest in this issue, this, the, the whole situation at the base of the food web. It's quite variable among the different algal groups. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so now I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what I think about when I'm, the, the idea of using biochemical trophic tracers. This is a cartoon that my grad student, Ren, put together. And what it does is it simplifies the world, as we always have to do as scientists when we're first trying to make something complex manageable to our minds, into a nice little cartoon where different pr producer groups, here's, in this case, we have some phytoplankton, nereocystis, bull kelp, and some other macroalgae, have distinctive markers. So this is the best case scenario for using biomarkers in a, in a trophic context is that if you have different markers that indicate sources of production, those can be traced into the consumers that forage on them. And those can be traced all the way through a food web. And so if, if a fish has markers that indicate it was, in this case, this cartoon has indicates that this fish has markers that meant that all of these producers were contributing to its uh, trophic ecology, essentially. So for this to work, to, under, to, to get into this, really what we have to care about is the producers, the consumers, and the trophic transfer of these, these biomarkers. So when I first started doing work in this field, I realized, and I'm not the first to realize this, obviously, but this whole thing is shot if the producers themselves don't have different marker profiles. You can't do it. That's not going to be a useful tool if, if the producers are all the same or if the consumers are all the same. So one of the things that I started out by doing is looking at the uh, diversity of fatty acid content in producers. And I'll talk about some of those results in a second. But one of the really important issues that are unfortunately commonly overlooked is the trophic transfer issue. And what this boils down to is that it's not as simple as when you eat something, it gets stored in your, in your tissues, and it's all good, and we can just use that marker, the presence of that marker, to indicate that you ate that thing. This is a, another cartoon that kind of simplifies and shows, for the case of this isopod in our cartoon, that assuming this isopod is eating this alga, and there's a couple of these, let's just say, fatty acids in our cartoon world that are respired and wasted. Those aren't stored in the tissues. But 
One of them is, the red one is. But also what's happening in organisms is that they're converting. They're modifying their, their, their fatty acids. They're modifying the proteins they get. And some of that stuff is stored as new tissues. And so what you end up with is the retained fatty acids. And in this cartoon, we're showing that there's a, a unique fatty acid that was not present in any of the diets that shows up in the consumer. And so, unfortunately, if we don't study this, the biomarker approach is, has some serious limitations. And so what I've built my early career around is actually studying this for a number of consumers and looking at the, doing experiments to, to figure out how this trophic transfer works. Um, because we can use, there's many different ways we can use these biomarkers. And in some cases, you can just say the presence of this biomarker might indicate the presence of that source in a consumer's diet. But without knowing about the, tr the tr trophic fractionation or fatty acid modification, um, it, it's largely unknown what, what's going on. So, okay, so I talked about how, or I said in the title that I would talk about kind of traditional and novel approaches. And I'm trying to marry these two really different things because I've had, I have some cool stories to tell about just cool stuff that I saw underwater in the last uh, couple of years. So I, I wanted to point out that it's hard to do this kind of work in the subtitle. So that's one of the reasons why biomarkers are so valuable at the base of the food web, is because we can't necessarily just easily observe what some subtitle critter is doing all the time. It, they're often small creatures that eat algae, and they're often in deep, inaccessible places. OK, so I'm going to do a little overview on fatty acids. There's many different unique fatty acids and types of fatty acids in uh, different lipid classes in any given organism. And so I'm going to kind of gloss over the different lipid classes, but point out that in the, there's fatty acids that you have in all of your cells, of course, and there's storage fatty acids as well. But really what I'm going to talk about is the extractions that we do, we take the total fatty acids out of a given sample, and we often need to break them into categories. And so it's worth talking about functional groups. You've, and, I, and even if you're not interested in fatty acids, you've heard of these functional groups. Saturated fatty acids. Why is it a saturated fatty acid? It sits, it's a hard uh, fat that sits on your countertop, like a chunk of butter. Um, and monounsaturated fatty acids. So what this indicates is that there's one double bond in this molecule. And polyunsaturated fatty acids, which include a number of different fatty acids that I'll talk about throughout the day. But in particular, one that I want to point out is 25 omega-3, which is EPA. And so when you see these, this molecule diagram, what this is indicating is that the 20 is showing that there's 20 carbons in the, in the molecule. The 5 is showing that there's five double bonds. And, that the, and the omega-3 indicates the position of the last double bond on the chain. Yeah, I've got to use this thing. I forgot there's people online. So that's right here. So that's why this is 25 omega-3. So I'll come back to that in a second as well. So what are the sources of essential fatty acids? I mean, you, you and I, when we go to the store, this is marketing. We see a lot of this. I, I personally take fish oil. Uh, as part of my diet, my doctor recommends I, that we do. Um, anyway, but the but most people in the in the public don't understand that these omega three, omega six essential fatty acids they're not synthesized by fish. Um, they're not synthesized by the cows that make the milk that's enriched in in these things. This is all produced by algae. This is a really cool ecosystem service that the algae provide for our entire biosphere. It's actually Really cool that algae are out there growing, and plants can they can both produce essential um, fatty acids, and I'll I'll show that in a second. And why does that matter? Well, that matters because the it, one of the reasons they're quote unquote essential is that animals can't make them, and we need them. And so this is a, a recent overview uh, synthesis work that we just had published. Where we, one of the things we did in this paper is we took published data from a bunch of studies and 
and collapsed them to these large groups like bivalves, crustaceans, fish, and looked at the normalized dietary EFA content. And what this basically shows is that for these different response variables, different researchers have used different things. In fact, Louise Koopman, your paper, one of your papers is in this graph right here in the fish section. Um, <laughs> but so people have known for a while that these essential fatty acids are important predictors for growth, um, whether that be reproduction or actual growth for larval fish or all kinds of organisms. So that's one of the reasons it matters. So a, a quick overview of, of the way this whole thing works, and this is important when I talk about modification of fatty acids. The fatty acid synthesis occurs through elongation, which is this vertical axis here, or desaturation, which is the horizontal axis. And so I'm about to show a bunch of fatty acids that are interesting to me that I use a lot in my in my research. And the point is, is that producers are able to insert double bonds through the, desat the desaturation aspect and create these, um, these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Whereas consumers can't do that. We have to get those from our diet. Once we have the precursor fatty acids, like lin and ala, um, consumers can elongate those and modify those. So consumers can still alter the fatty, the fatty acids that they get in their diet. It's just that they cannot synthesize these key um, baseline essential fatty acids. OK, so I'm spending a lot of time on this because you know it's fun to talk about the big picture. I'll, I will spend time talking about the actual research. Don't worry. I hope, I hope you guys are still with me. Um, <laughs> But so like I said, in order to get at some of the big picture questions that I like to work on, I, we, we have to figure out whether the producers themselves have different fatty acid profiles. And, and, and why does this matter? Well, the algae are incredibly diverse. So just for the macro algae alone, there's over 650 known described species in the northwest waters. So there's many different species of algae out there. So I'll just cut to the chase. I, I'm not going to show all these different results, but we've now worked on this throughout. I did a lot of this work in my postdoc phase, but we've looked at this for macrophytes, for freshwater phytoplankton, for uh, phytoplankton that are in freshwater and marine and brackish habitats. And basically the, the, the take home message is, is that there's very strong separation among the groups. And so I'm going to show a one example of all of those papers that kind of just drives the, the, the point. And so I'll take a minute, first of all, to describe when I'm, I'm going to show a bunch of fatty acid plots throughout this talk. And so let me orient you to these plots. This is a principal components analysis. And what this is doing is taking a lot of data, this 44 FA, there's 44 variables being squished into two dimensions here. So and if you haven't seen these before, what this basically shows is the, the actual axes are somewhat hard to interpret. They don't mean very much. But what's important is that points that are close to each other in this space have very similar fingerprints, if you will, of their fatty acid composition. Okay, So they're similar. And what this is showing is that for these 40 different orders, uh, 40 different species that we looked at for macrophytes, that there's very strong separation um, by the different groups of algae. So I'm here I'm circling the uh, phylum level. So red algae, brown algae, greens, and these are seagrasses here. And so that's very satisfying when you're working with fatty acids and you plot the data in multivariate space. And they group out really quite well, quite nicely. And what, what happens is when you, you can do the analysis down to the, to the level of even algal orders. So different orders even differ from each other within the reds within the browns. Um, and so the, and that we had to do some stats to show that, but that's, that's been documented now. And what's also kind of cool is that those kind of, that phylogenetic signal also shows up in the consumers. So different groups of consumers have, usually have, as far as I've ever seen, have distinctive fatty acid kind of zones relative to others. And so this is a plot of five different invertebrates from the San Juan Islands that kind of makes this point. These are 
uh, the crabs, some scallops. This is Fusitriton, a, a snail. This is a sea cucumber, and this is an urchin. And what this is showing is that these are all the samples that we analyzed, and these, even within these species, we sampled them at different depths, different places, and there's, there's structure that occurs within that species. But the main point that I'm trying to drive home here is that there's fundamental difference at the level of the organism from each other. And that shows up um, any time that you basically plot any different organisms, fatty acid profiles. And that's handy for the work that we do. And I also want to kind of point out that there's an interesting, uh, an interesting outcome of this is that when a community composition changes, when phytoplankton composition changes, the fatty acids therefore change in that system. So at the ecosystem scale, if you have a, a community of phytoplankton go from being uh, diatoms to cyanobacteria, when this is actually a very real thing that happens in, like for example, in the Baltic Sea, uh, we have the whole Baltic Sea is dominated by cyanobacteria, for example, a lot of the year. That means that the, the, the community composition of the, of the algae changing affects what fatty acids are out there and what um, is available for organisms that consume them. OK, so that was my intro, <laughs> and it took 25 minutes. So the, the rest of the talk is really just a couple of case studies that I want to talk about on, um, first of all, isopods <coughs> and resource use, Dungeness crabs, and some interesting observations we made in the field, and a very short minuet on the blue-colored flesh and lingcod. So these ones are going to be, the, the, the last one is a much shorter case study. But I just wanted to kind of talk about some of the things that we're, we've been doing with these traditional and novel approaches for looking at food webs. So I've been working for a while now with isopods. Pentida tia is the new genus um, for this. It's an intertidal herbivore, and it can be important because it can, it can mow down the al algae that's out there if it's left unchecked. Um, it, they're known to have a hierarchy of prey preferences, and organisms like to eat isopods. And one of the, the neat things about isopods is that they're brooders. So they keep their babies on board. The mommy has, has the little babies underneath them, and so we can harvest those babies and do experiments on them. Uh, <laughs> which is, sounds terrible, really, when I say that. But it's, say that with the people laugh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is one of the reasons I like to work with invertebrates, is it's much more simple to, 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 to work with an organism that doesn't have a complex nervous system compared to, yeah, so actually they do have nervous system, but okay, so <laughs> this is a, um, I, I want to show a beach that, I look at a beach and I see this, right, this is a beach that, where one of the places that we studied algal community composition and isopods in the sand, in the, uh, this is Puget Sound, and what the isopod experiences, of course, is a much different world, it's still that world, but it's at the level of the barnacles, you know, and so one of the things that I'm really interested in doing here is, is actually showing an example of how we can use fatty acids to tease apart the diets of these individual um, animals in, in the field, who otherwise we'd have no way of understanding what they're, what they're eating. So we do feeding trials with juvenile isopods. So we've done a number of these trials. This is an example of the three millimeter sized baby isopod that's been removed from the mom and populated into these tanks and fed a combination. Over the years, we've fed a combination of all kinds of different algae, brown algae, green, and reds. And here's a, a couple examples of some of the species we've fed them. And when you feed them like that for, for a long time, they, uh, they, the questions that we started with is like, how do they, do they pick up that signal? So here's this first slide that I'm showing now is another multidimensional plot. This is a multi, non-metric multidimensional dimensional scaling plot, NMDS. It's like a PCA for all intents and purposes. And so this is with 13 fatty acids. And what this is showing is not too different from what I showed you a minute ago with all those 40 different al algal species. This is just showing for pyropia, a red al alga, and two brown algae, and a green alga, where those fatty acid signatures plot for just the diets. 
Okay, so now we fed the animals, we fed the isopods these diets, just these pure diets, for 10 weeks in the lab. And this is what happens. These are the fatty, these are actual photographs of animals in that treatment, and the fatty acids of the animals fed those diets. And I mean, that is just fantastic from my perspective. When I first saw this, I got pretty excited because this is very distinctive. Uh, you know, the animals that are fed green algae group together much differently from the other animals. And they're still in the same realm of the plot where the green algae are. But of course, it's important to point out here that they're not exactly lined up with their algal diets. Okay? And, they'll ne and one of the things I have figured out uh, is that they'll never be lined up with their algal diets. And this is the case for any organism that, that deals with something as different as algae. You know, on the one hand, you have an alga. And on the other hand, you have a creature. They have different fatty acid signatures no matter what they eat. They could eat. So there's kind of an, a zone in the middle where this is the isopod zone. And so this, well, I, I do need to po point out that this is basically trophic modification in multivariate space. And so we have to account for that. So we did account for that by doing these feeding trials. And what this shows is that now I've taken away the algae, and I'm just plotting the animals fed known diets. So these, are is these colored symbols here are isopods fed different brown algal species. And these are isopods fed ova, green, and isopods fed different red algal species. So even though these algal diets are quite different from each other, if you think about it, um, like they still group in, in multivariate space with each other. And now this is the, these are a bunch of wild isopods that we collected in the field plotted in that space. And so what we're doing here is accounting for trophic modification in situ, in the plot. Does that make sense? Like, because of the fact that we're not showing algae, we're showing the fatty acids of animals fed known algal diets. We've accounted for that trophic modification. That allows us to make uh, inferences, more quantitative inferences, about the diet of these animals. And so what we did is we went to a number of sites in, this, in the Puget Sound area and we chose sites that had very different algal compositions, which is shown in this plot here. So this is the percentage total algal cover. And we looked at that for these different sites, and we analyzed the fatty acid content of the animals in those sites. And I just discovered today that, unfortunately, the plot, even though it's a PDF, somehow, unbeknownst to me, has doesn't show up in this computer, because it's a PC. But I think the point will still work. It's just that these little numbers are a little bit funky. These x-axis numbers are the proportion. Okay, so this is 0 to 100. That's supposed to be like 0.8 right there. Okay, so 0 to 100. I'm gonna before I show you the data, I'm gonna orient you to the kind of results that these um, quantitative outputs generate. And so what this is gonna show is for any given source in our model, which is red algae, brown algae, or green algae, what's the relative contribution, the proportion of, of of that source was supporting that consumer. And the y-axis is just a density plot based on a mixing model analysis. So what I've done here is, and this is the, the main topic of uh, the, the, the end of my PhD and my uh, postdoc time, is we adapted a, um, an isotope mixing model um, called Mixer and then also SIAR, which are common isotope mixing models. We adapted it and said, why can't we just run this with fatty acids? And so we made it work with fatty acids. Is described in the paper. But essentially what that allows us to do is get quantitative estimates of resource use based on their fatty acids. And so on, the y, on this other plot here, it's showing for that particular site, Richmond Beach, what the algal cover was like. So it was 80% green algae and, 20, and about 18% red algae in the field at that site. And so what this is showing us, first of all, is that of the five, you can't see this very well, and I'm really sorry about that, but each color is a different animal. It's a different replicate, unique individual. What this is showing is that the model says that, on average, the group is somewhere between 0 and about 30 to percent uh, supported by reds. Basically, nil on browns and about 60 to 100 percent supported by the greens. I find this very interesting because this is basically what was available in the field. Um, and so <clears throat> we've, we've done this for a couple of different sites. Um, and the take home is, is that 
across the different sites, these uh, animals often lined up pretty closely with the, with the algal, algae that was available in the field in terms of their proportion that they ate. But the thing that's really cool is that they don't all do the same thing. So in that previous slide, you saw there's a lot of differences between the individuals. In some sites, they're stacked on top of each other. Some sites, they're extremely different from each other, any given animal to each other. And I don't actually know the reason for that. Okay, so that's just one of the take-homes that I'd like to present here is that these types of analyses are not panacea, like everything's figured out now. Um, oftentimes, it's just like it gives you ideas, new hypotheses that you can test. Are they indeed eating? Wh why would they be eating such diverse, more, more diverse diets at one site versus another? And so it gives us ideas about natural history and experiments that we can actually do to follow up on that. So some of the next steps that we're working on now, I wanted to give a plug to this. This is um, work that my postdoc and I are working on now at OIMB, is we're following up on this by com making the feeding trials more complex. So we're mi making mixtures of algae and forcing the animals to eat these 50-50 mixtures of these different algae. And then also, we've noticed that the coloration of the isopods, after all this fancy biomarker work, I thought it was really crazy that in the end we took photographs of all the animals and the ones that ate red algae looked red, the ones that ate green algae looked green, and the ones that ate brown algae looked brown. And so we're really curious about that though because isopods are known to have quite a lot of variation in their coloration. And, it, and I don't expect that it's only about diet. It had also to do with the fact that there was red, green, and brown algae in their tank with them. And so by we're, we're now doing experiments where we're manipulating the coloration of their substrates and then comparing that with the, 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 the fatty acids. So that's work that I don't have results for yet. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a major turn and start now talking about uh, basically a natural history observation that drove some follow-up work on um, fatty acids that I'm now starting at the lab. And this is about crabs, metacarcinus, I hate saying that, but it is cancer magister metacarcinus. Um, and this is near and dear, this species is near and dear to almost all of our hearts on the Oregon coast, as we, most of us probably know. It's a dominant crustacean out here, um, and it generates quite a lot in terms of its value as a fishery. Over 30 metric tons are landed between Oregon, California, and Washington each year. I mean, that is mind-blowing. That's a huge amount. And it's a voracious predator, so it's, it's really interesting from that perspective. It's known to eat almost anything. They're known to eat each other, um, and they're also known as omnivores. And so they have larval release in the winter, and megalope develop offshore and land what's thought, the, the general paradigm is that they land in the coastal landing strip, which is the soft sediment bot bottoms of the coast and in estuaries in the spring and summer. So this is a story about um, an observation that I made that was surprising and kind of different from that paradigm. So this is a, we went diving in April in 2016. Just a fun dive at, at Port Orford. Anybody have dove at Port Orford in here before? All right, cool. Yeah, so this is just Graveyard Point. Just walk in. Um, it was a great dive. It was beautiful, rocky reef. We went back in a couple weeks later, and unfortunately, I didn't have my camera. So you guys are going to be like, not believing me. The camera was not in the water. Um, and so... But one of the, it was one of the craziest dives I've ever been on in my life because from 20 feet to 40 feet down, every surface on vertical rock walls, algae, covered bottoms, uh, boulders, cobbles, sand, every surface that you could possibly encounter was completely covered with 7 millimeter new settled crabs. They covered every surface and then they covered each other, three deep. It was like a, a nightmare. Um, <laughs> but I loved it, <laughs> and I stuffed them in my pocket. I was just, Doug Batson was with me. I don't know, some of you guys might know Doug. It, is he here? No. Okay. Uh, um, I stuffed them in my pocket, and I emerged from the water and, you know, had my phone out and took this picture of them and um, encountered Jessica Watson. Is she here? Yeah. All right. Hey, Jessica. And um, I remember being like, oh, you're a biologist. It was the first time I think we met. I remember being like, oh, you're a biologist? Then you're going to love this. You know, like, check this out. These are everywhere. And she thought 
that was cool. And she said, that's really interesting because we were just a couple of days ago fishing at Depot Bay for the Marine Reserves program, and the black rockfish were regurgitating out crabs in this same size class up at Depot Bay. That's a pretty far, that's pretty far away. So that got me thinking like, at first I thought, okay, this is just a random experience. We just saw a huge landing at this one spot. And we still don't know how much, how large the extent was in terms of spatial distribution. So I went back a couple days later, uh, this is actually two weeks later, and got pictures. And they were still down there. Um, the numbers had decreased to about 11,000 individuals per square meter. Um, <laughs> they decreased. So based on doing some math, based on what I described, the fact that they covered everything and that they're seven millimeters wide, we came up with an estimate of 20 to 60,000 individuals on that initial settlement, which is really mind-blowing per square meter. Right. So that's all published now in a scientific naturalist uh, article in Ecology. And so we went back and we did some dives at these sites over the last um, over that last year and, and kind of monitored the situation. So I'm going to show one of the videos. I have to make this stop, right? Make the laser pointer stop, yeah. So that day that I took that last picture that you saw, this exact same day, we saw out at Port Orford at Redfish Rocks that ODFW had a, an ROV out there. And so I, I was like, that's interesting. We have a lot of crabs in the near shore. So I asked, I called and asked, and, and some of the folks at ODFW said, yeah, we have actual video of crabs in, in, out here at, Port, at Redfish Rocks as well. So this is also part of the kind of the story that we told in that scientific naturalist paper. And as I've asked around, I've come to discover that Indeed, people have observed landing events of crabs in the subtitle before. It's not like it's never happened before. It's just that nobody's ever described like 20 to 60,000 per square meter. That just was like, whoa. So the pictures here, we don't have scale bars, but these are taken by uh, Scott Groth, who's an ODFW biologist, in 2008 at the same place at Fort Orford. And we estimate, based on the size of the crabs and the, and the field of view, that this is, as, these are densities of about 500 to 1,000 per square meter. So this happens periodically. We don't know how often and what it means and whether it's um, kind of like what the biological significance of that is. So in this picture alone, there's 125 crabs that I've circled for you. One of the neat things is, is that they're doing cool behaviors that we don't know about or didn't know about. So this is video that I went back in the summer with Andrew Thurber and Sarah Seabrook. Sarah might be here today. Um, but Andrew is an OSU professor, and um, he said, I'll take some videos, because I said, we're going to find the crabs. I promise you, we're going to find these crabs, because we still see them swimming around. And so he took some videos, and I realized I watched these a bunch of times, just combing it over for interesting stuff. And you can see a swarm of my mice. And as I watched these videos at the end of the day, I realized that crabs are actually foraging on the mice. They're reaching and grabbing and sometimes successfully picking mice out of the water column, which is just, which is just crazy. Um, that hasn't been described before, so that's also part of that um, scientific naturalist. So, so again, just cool observations that if we just go underwater and look, you never know what you'll see. Um, later in the summer, we, we found pods of roving um, juvenile crabs that are probably two-year-olds. So this is a vertical rock wall at, at, at Tishner Rock, a pod of about 50 to 100 crabs. And I've done a lot of diving in my career, and I can say I don't ever see Dungeness crabs running around on vertical rock walls. It, it, it just really surprised me. Um, maybe somebody else has. I'd be curious if you have. But I typically see Dungeness crabs in soft sediment, um, buried in the sediment, or sometimes they come out, but not like this. So I think that there's some really cool things going on on our coast, and you know, I'm working on studying that, basically. So. One of the things that makes the storyline for this crab development really interesting is that Alan Shanks, my colleague at OMB, has had a, a, a light trap that he's been running for about 17 years. I think um, what he does is that throughout the whole seven season, for about five or six months, he goes and checks this light trap on a daily basis and counts all the megalopi that have come into the trap. So it's kind of an index. It is an index um, through time. Carly is laughing because she's helped with this. Um, and what you can see is that over the course of the time that Alan's been doing this, there's been the, 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 the index areas that have actually been growing. So some years there's up to two or three million crabs that would be the total that they catch.
match across the settlement season, just in this light track app. And what's weird is that the year that we had this large landing event in Port Orford was one of his lowest ever. Um, you can see that circle down here. And so Alan and I actually argue. We don't know. We have all these hypotheses, and we like to debate. And we argue about what we think is going on. And what's funny is that we don't have the same ideas. Um, but I enjoy it because neither of us know. And this is one of the things that I'm hoping to do more research on. But if, if, is there a reason why the year that we noticed a huge settlement on the outer coast, that there's such a low settlement in the bay? You know, is that connected or is it disconnected? Um, so there's a lot of work that can be done there. I've had NSF reviews. Um, NSF's in review to do this work. I just found out today that my NSF was turned down to do more work on this. But, but I won't want to be discouraged. I'll keep doing the work in some form or fashion. And, and, and in part, I'll be doing it by doing these kind of like kind of summer experiments. These, this is work that I'm going to show that was done by uh, myself and um, one of the grad students in our group. And what we did is we then manipulated. I thought, this is interesting. Why don't I see what happens with we create these densities that I observed in nature in the lab? Because you know, densities like that, there's such intense competition with these crowds. They're, they're quite like, like nasty little creatures. They, like, they fight each other. They eat each other. Um, they have to mold, and that's a dangerous process. So I, I did a couple of experiments where we kept them at high density, medium density, and low density, where they're back to we're varying this by a factor of 10. And um, what we learned essentially is that the, so this, sorry, this y axis here is average carapace width through time. And that basically in the high density treatments, they just don't grow. They just don't mold, essentially. They just tough it out. It's such a, it's such a mess out there in, in that little space with all those crabs. All they can do is just divide it out and wait. Eventually, crabs start dying off. And the densities drop down enough that they can start to mold. But it's still a quite dangerous process. So, this is the same type of data, the same time series that was plotted at the actual main density um, on this y axis. So, basically, what this is showing is yeah, we started them at 15,000 per square meter. But through time, these guys here, uh, the, the numbers were declined at about week six, which is when the high density treatment actually started to grow. So we, one of the other interesting things that came out of this, too, is that we fed them each other in one treatment and then fed them clam in another. So I would take some and crush them up and feed them to each other. Because cannibalism is a major factor for these crabs. Everybody knows that they, that, that they do that. Um, and, and what's interesting is that this diet, either each other or what we thought would be the ideal diet, the clam in, um, doesn't result in any differences in their growth. So now the things that we're doing there to follow up on that is we're, we're starting to do the, the feeding trials with the crabs to try to do something similar to what I showed you with the isopods. So we're feeding crabs very distinctive, different diets, and then trying to get fatty acid profiles out of them so that in the future we might be able to interpret their, um, what, what, what they're actually eating in the field. And essentially what we found with this is that initially, this is already work from my RU student, that we found faster growth, um, but lower survival on the meat diet. So we had them at a greenhouse, and we also had them poop from urchins that were based on green algae. And, and it's interesting that they ate the, the feces, and they ate the algae. So they actually totally devoured the algae. Um, but their growth was um, slower. So this is intermolt period. So this, this is, with molding individuals, it's difficult to measure growth. You have to measure like, the, very, the thing that we measure is the, the, the period between molds. And essentially, we found that the clam and rockfish, they grow fastest on those diets, but then their survival is lowest on those diets. Because it's the trade off. If, if you're growing when you're a crab, you have to mold. And molting is hard. And there's just fundamentally quite a lot of mortality that happens. So, like I said, the next steps that we're working on there is just looking at fatty acids and, and eventually building up a fast at our prey light rate. Okay, okay, so I'm going to touch on a couple of points just from this blue lingcod story. Um, have you guys ever had a blue lingcod? Have you ever caught it? Okay, okay, cool. So when I came to Oregon, I didn't know about blue lingcod. So the very first 
uh, Lincoln that I speared, I got to the surface and realized, wait, it didn't just look weird underwater. This is weird. This is bright blue. And this really blew me away. Um, if you can see, I don't know if it shows, but if you haven't seen it before, it's almost like neon, right? It's, it's quite bright. And asking people down in the docks, what is it that people will say, oh, it's from what they eat. I come to find out that there's not, there haven't been any published scientific studies on this. Um, and that just, that just makes me go, what the heck? I can't accept that. We have to do research on this. Um, you know, this just, being a trophic ecologist, it is, you know, it really kind of got me going. Um, so I started looking into it. I mean, basically what it's, it's thought that the blue lip, the color is from the bile pigment by liver pigment, and that's likely what it is. Um, it's been shown for other, for actual true cod, Atlantic cod, that uh, by liver content can increase in the gallbladder during starvation. Uh, but that's not a fish where it's known that they, that, that, that by liver isn't known to just bleed into the tissues and make their tissues bleed. So I don't know if it's, it could be a trophic signal, um, but of course trophic could mean many things. It could mean starvation. So I have a, a number of hypotheses that we're um, pursuing. Um, I've, I've done some, some research on this now. And discovered that there's actually some really great old papers um, buried, as there always is. Every time you ever do a literature search, you always discover that. Like, well, somebody wrote about this in Bizarre Artish in 1941. Um, so well, these are all papers where different examples of researchers have said, yes, we found a blue fish. The actual blue fish was bright blue. It's been documented in a number of cottages. Um, Cabazon, Sculpin, etc. And so, but again, none of these papers has ever said, and this is why, and we figured out why. So I'm trying to work on that now. Um, and so, so just to get, like I said, this is going to be a quick overview. But in, to do this, we started by collaborating with Jessica, <laughs> you're famous. Um, and, and I'm not going to talk about the growth, the, the work that we did. There's respect to the research, but just to respect to the blue tissue thing. Um, we just decided to collaborate on a project where they're going out and sampling ling cod in the reserves. And in particular, at Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve, they were able to, to take a number of fish measurements and give us biopsies that we're looking at for fatty acids and stable isotopes. And they wisely kept track of the color of the fish. So this is independent from my initial, like, whoa, blue rock, rock blue, blue cod. Um, and I got this data set, and I was like, wow, this is our, a chance for us to actually think about what's causing the blue tissues in these, a, a nice chunk of fish that we had. So they, we, we had 74 fish from this, and we found that 26% of them were blue, first of all. Um, but the really interesting part, and I've never seen this written about in other videos, is that the fish that are blue, the story is, is, is strongly dominated by the, the gender of the, of the fish. So 90% of the wing cod with blue flesh are also female. And so that's really interesting. A number like 90% to an ecologist just makes you go like, okay, there's something important about that. Um, so if it is about uh, trophic ecology, it's got to be also about uh, the trophic ecology that's relative to the fact that they're female and the things that females do. Um, and so the, this is just showing the, the, the size of the fish versus, and, and, and whether they're blue or not, they didn't differ overall, although the biggest fish were not blue. Um, and so here we go. I ran the fatty acid on these fish and discovered that among them there was no differences. Um, and so I'm glad I got to show you a plot earlier where there's nice season really separation, but in reality, it doesn't always work quite nicely for us. Um, and so this is interesting. I'm still trying to interpret what this all means, but, but what essentially what it means is that the fatty acids of these fish um, either are not sensitive to diet in the same way that they might be, let's say, in an invertebrate like an isopod, or that the blue coloration thing just doesn't have anything to do with the fatty acids and possibly their diet. So I did look at, let's see, yeah, okay. So on the other hand, you can also use a couple of these um, univariate values. So I'm, I'm, I'm presenting some data here showing uh, about the, the fact that there were actually lower total omega-6 fatty acids in the female. So this was a significant difference on this y-axis of showing a raw 
um, omega-6 fatty acid content. So, so I still I'm not sure what the final interpretation of this is, but it is interesting because omega-6 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory um, um, like precursors. So these are what are used for um, generating eicosanoids. And so that could be important. I'm, I'm not sure if it is yet. yet. But I have also looked at that the isotopic signatures of these of values of these fish. And, and what we've discovered is that the, um, while the, the delta T10, which is an indicator of trophic position, which didn't differ between blue and non-blue fish, the delta T carbon values did. So fish that were blue were enriched relative to non-blue. And so again, I don't have any big answers yet. Um, and I want to point out that these this actual differences, the magnitude of differences in the scale are really small. So it could be one of those things where it's like statistically significant, ecologically relevant. I don't know. But nonetheless, these are blue and non-blue fish. So this has given us ideas. Like I said earlier, it gives us hypotheses to, to, to follow up on. So one, one thing could be that, that I've talked to a couple of fish physiologists, which I'm not, um, and, and come up with some ideas that it's possible that females are, are more likely to be blue because they're putting more energy into egg production. And that there's something about this. This actually came up in a different um, paper that I read as well. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and, and whether this is connected to the omega-6 fatty acid content, then I don't know. Um, and Yamaguchi et al. in 1976 when writing about other um, scopes in blue flesh scopes said that, in his opinion, he didn't think that the blueness was connected to diet at all. He was thinking that the blue tissue is by liberty restored in the, in the muscle so that it could be quickly mobilized for use for uh, camouflage or to mobilize and camouflage the eggs. Because I guess sometimes their eggs can be also so bright, bright blue. And so that could, it could be something about camouflage of the eggs or UV protection of the eggs um, in the habitats of the wing cotter. So the multivariate fatty acid suggests that the diet composition doesn't differ much, if at all. And it's unknown whether these are, are, are not showing that there's any differences in, in diet. So I was left with this question, the big question of how common is this across the range? And so I, I gave you a version of this talk at WSN, which went to Society of Naturalists a couple weeks ago. And I had the good fortune of meeting a group of researchers who just did a huge latitudinal survey with uh, Lincoln from, from, uh, from Alaska to Southern California. And now we're going to collaborate. They actually did collect information on blue tissues, and they got all kinds of other stuff as well. Like, uh, Go down index, index. They actually sacrificed the fish. So they had the ability to get a little bit more than we did. They just released the fish after taking a biopsy. And so, so we're working on them to, with, with them, to have, to have a data set. This data set has over 2,000 link cod observations in it. So we have, we're going to be able to analyze the blueness question with this huge, with this larger data set. And I, I can tell you right now that basically the proportions, this 26% is similar across the range. There's parts of the range where it's about 15 to 20%, um, but that's a relatively common number. Um, and in addition, the blueness is more common in the shallow wing cod. So they also collect it on that depth gradient. And so you know, we're going to plug all this into basically a fancy good regression model and, 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 and figure out what it all means. Okay, so I've, I've talked a lot, um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm done, except, except for some of the I want to say that I want to kind of nail this point home. The particularly useful with trophic spacers is that they say so the blood. I hope that that makes sense, because what I showed is that the profanity of the algae are such an interesting and diverse um, group of organisms that they have such distinctive fatty acid signatures that you have a lot of traction to try to track that, that, that those differences into a consumer. Yes, that's traction, that track those kind of differences into a, a predator. And I thought that our, our little experiment with the
choices, but I try. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of value in the face of the big right there. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, do you have any questions? No, really good question. I, I 
Is whether the larvae will also be like, like, is it something that they're always blue? You know, that's 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 one I don't know about at all. All I've seen is, you know, I've only sampled them and they're big enough to catch. So, you know, you know. That's interesting. Yeah, because there's definitely males, males that are blue. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm glad you told me that. That's cool. It'd be nice to talk to you about that later. Thanks. Yeah, I think this near shore thing is, is really interesting because where I spearfish is even rarer near shore. And we've got a lot of times it's like 40%, 50% blues that seem to come up on the boat with people. So I don't know what it all means, but it does seem that it's connected to that. So, anyway. Right. By Liberty. By Liberty, yeah. Um, that is a, a intermediate product of the heating and tap. Metabolism. I don't know very really much about it, to be really honest with you. It's just from what I've read. Um, I don't know what the function is. Okay. Oh, cool. I, I need to know about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot I have to learn. I mean, I just got into the meeting and so I did. Cool. Okay, thanks. Good to know. I can do.
the allegations are different now. So the, our, our current experiments, what we're doing is we're actually taking away the mechanical issues. We cut out the algorithm, designed it to a uniform particle distribution. We set that out of our lives. Then we can pick a mixture so that we know exactly what the mixture happens to be. So when I say they're using a mixture, and they, they have a piece of bread and a piece of meat, but they just do want a lot more. But we force them to keep a mixture. But for those three other experiments, we have cut them the pieces in small enough pieces that they could keep the same. Maybe. Uh, probably, yeah, yeah, probably. We, we, we use the, the pretty palatable ground. So, like, we, we didn't make any of this bits of area. We keep this. I mean, we, we didn't use, um, like, a graph, for example. We have another TV shop where we make tables for the area. Yeah. 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 So, you have an online question. So, if you want a big old question. <laughs> Okay, that's really interesting because I talked to the SWN and I also talked to a, um, um, a, a worm biologist, I can't remember her name right now, but she's a friend of mine. She talked to me in the email about how these can see just like right, right to where I was like, okay, my neighbors are some biology that she works with. So you can see right through the worm itself, but it exits the guy's right to the And she was saying, she was saying that they thought it was for um, camouflage, but in case it takes. But, but that's really cool of information. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I guess we'll take a look at the back of the slide.